Hello and welcome. Uh, joining us uh, today is a very special guest, somebody uh, even as you know the entire IC814 series has gotten into a lot of controversy. Somebody who had a ringside view of events at that point of time was a member of the Cabinet Committee on Security. Joining us is former Union Minister Mr. Yashwan Sinha, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us uh, to discuss what was very clearly a very important part of Indian history and particularly when it comes to our national security, a very, very important episode indeed. Uh, let me begin by asking you, sir, you've been part of the CCS, which is, of course, the Cabinet Committee on Security. Uh, from a strategic point of, uh, when you look at uh, the incident about two and a half decades later, there are a number of questions that still remain. There are questions over whether there was time wasted, whether decision-making process could have been utilized better, whether there could have been diplomatic channels that could have been utilized better, and whether ultimately releasing three high-profile terrorists was the best course of action. Looking back 25 years hence, how do you view the entire episode? Well, <clears throat> I have heard the questions that you have in your mind. And as you say, many people have in their mind. The point is that uh, 25 years down the line, in retrospect, everyone is wiser. Uh, what they fail to realize is the real atmosphere which prevailed in the country at that point of time which uh, led the government to take the decisions that it took. And um, <clears throat> since, as you said, I had a ringside view, the Cabinet Committee on Security, I remember, was uh, almost continuously in meetings. Ev at every step, every uh, response was discussed. And uh, today, I'm very happy to note that we were able to save the lives of the passengers on board that plane. If we had allowed all those people to die that day, then the only thing which people of this country would have remembered is not that we held back the terrorists, but the fact that so many people were allowed to be killed on that plane. Right. Sir, I would like to also take you through some of the important points uh, and important questions that have been raised. Uh, of course, there are a number of facts in the movie, in the series rather, that have come out now uh, that are in dispute. But one of the things that has been portrayed and uh, as per news reports uh, is that the Prime Minister was informed about the plane hijacking after about 100 minutes had passed. Considering the gravity of the situation with 189 lives, at stake, as you rightly mentioned, what could have possibly been the reason for delaying the briefing to the Prime Minister immediately after the hijacking was confirmed? I would like to suggest to you that we should not take whatever has been shown in the film as gospel truth. I would like to have independent verification of the fact that the Prime Minister of India was informed after 100 minutes. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, uh, our response was uh, immediate. Um, it was not the response that uh, perhaps we might want after 25 years, but um, all of us who were involved in the discussions and in the decision-making process, remember those days rather clearly. And um, unfortunately, most of the, uh, you know, the major actors of this uh, drama, this episode, are not with us anymore. As far as the Cabinet Committee on Security is concerned, the only two people who survive are Mr. Advani and myself. The rest um, have, uh, are, are not with us. So <clears throat> my uh, reaction to the film is that the film has taken liberties. The film is not entirely fact-based. I have heard the reaction of those who were on that flight that day. 
they also feel that the film has not represented them very well so the film is a film i mean it's it's uh, it's not uh, a history text written by uh, scholars after a great deal of research all right let's move on to the next aspect sir because uh, as far as the sequence of events is concerned amritsar where the hijack plane took off again there are questions about why the plane was allowed to take off from amritsar when mr as dulla the raw chief at the time was asked this particular question uh, you know his response was and i'm quoting because there was too much dilly dallying in the crisis management group or the cmg where nobody was willing to take a call the punjab police was blamed for what happened in amritsar why would you think there was a lack of uh, or a delay rather in the call being taken as the level of the cmg uh once again i'll say that uh, you know the lives of the passengers on that flight were at risk now even then 25 years earlier when all this was over i remember some people suggesting that we should have shot the tires of the plane we should not have allowed the plane to take off from amritsar we had a lot of time to take that kind of decision but what they forget is that suppose we had shot the tires of the plane or or held it on some other ground and the terrorists had taken the extreme step of uh, killing the passengers and killing themselves then would be would we be happier today that we allowed the passengers to be killed what we are not remembering or recalling to mind is the fact that at every step every moment of time the risk was there of the passengers losing their life and therefore one had to meet or make a move with a great deal of perspicacity right so uh, there's another episode which is in fact uh, been reported widely that the nsg was told at 625 on the day of the hijacking to leave for amritsar on the day of the hijacking in fact uh, they were there within about 45 minutes at 710 pm at the airport however they ended up waiting for the negotiators and at uh, 740 the cmg told the nsg to leave without the negotiators and the nsg left at 755 pm arrived in amritsar an hour after the hijack plane had departed do you think that this was uh, you know something that could have been avoided was there some kind of reluctance was there some kind of lack of coordination because uh, you know in today's day and age perhaps we can't think of something like this even taking place you know again this is uh, wisdom in retrospect that you you analyze what was happening every minute of the time every hour of the time and then come to your conclusion uh 25 years later that this is what should have been done what i am saying is dealing with <coughs> real events in real time is very different from thinking about them 25 years after the event Absolutely absolutely and also the question is that this has happened just months after uh, the Kargil conflict that took place which has also seen of course undoubtedly as uh, a huge breach uh, uh, a major security breach taking place in terms of this kind of hijacking happening and within a few months after this incident taking place we also see Masood Azhar then going on to orchestrate the attack on the Indian parliament in 2001 in terms of a strategic setback as far as a fallout of IC814 is concerned and of course the subsequent incidents that took place uh, how was it seen at that point of time because you know of course national security has always remained something of paramount importance but that scene as perhaps one of the most turbulent phases that india has had to go through you know national security uh, will be in line with national sentiment uh, you cannot have a national security uh, doctrine which is completely divorced from uh, the reality on the ground um, you know just one thing to uh, remind you of what was happening in those days every day in front of seven rescos road you will recall there were demonstrations people were coming in large numbers and uh, they were demanding that the 
the hostages be brought back alive, whatever the price, the hostages must be brought back alive. That was the pressure which was being put on the Prime Minister of India a few yards away from his home in uh, Racecourse Road in those days. And, uh, you know, any government which is democratically elected will have to respond to people's uh, sentiments. Now, those were the sentiments. Right. And, sir, have you had the opportunity to watch the series IC814, The Kandahar Hijack? I have watched it reluctantly. <laughs> I'm saying it... reluctantly because, <laughs> because, because, you know, it was supposed to reflect the incidents of those days um, and um, the events that transpired. But I was disappointed. You know, I was disappointed because um, perhaps it does not reflect the mood of the nation of those days. That okay. was my disappointment with this film. What, what, which aspect of it disappointed you the most in terms of one is the mood of the nation. There's also been some amount of criticism about the terrorists perhaps being humanized or glorified a bit much. Do you think those concerns are valid or the role of the Al-Qaeda being projected over the role of the ISI? Uh, any of these concerns that you found valid? No, apart from the... Apart from the... Uh, apart from the humanizing of the terrorists, which of course was a huge, huge mistake, I don't know whether you recall that there is a... there is an officer of an army officer, perhaps in Dubai, who is talking to the terrorists and explaining to them the precepts of uh, Islam. And at the end of it, he says that he is from Pakistan. Now, that appeared to me <laughs> to be very objectionable. I don't know whether it really happened or not, but for the film to depict a, a Pakistani army officer talking about Islam and saying um, that Islam does not permit such a thing was absolutely out of the place. Um, again, I am not sure whether such a thing happened, but along with the humanizing of the terrorists. This, I think, was a liberty which was taken in the film, which was entirely unavoidable, especially in view of the fact that the Pakistan was entirely behind it. The whole thing was conceived by ISI of Pakistan. And, uh, you know, left to me, I'll say, the people of India should never forget what happened in those days, 25 years later. And we should never, never forgive Pakistan for the aid and abetment that they provided for this dastardly act. Right. So you think there is some merit in the criticism where they say that the role of Al-Qaeda is projected, the role of Taliban is projected. And while ISI is mentioned, of course, that, uh, you know, we don't even see the ISI operators or the Pak Army operatives uh, physically, visually uh, through the series. Yeah, yeah. I think they have been kind um, to the terrorists. They have been kind to Pakistan in this series. Right. And also, so the fact that, uh, you know, the real names of these individuals. Now, we know that there was a statement that was put forth by the then Home Minister, uh, Mr. Advani, which, of course, had these code names of Bhola, Shankar, Burger, Dr. Chief. But it is a fact that uh, 25 years hence, and there have been books written which actually contain the real names of these individuals. Uh, are we making too much? Is it a bit of an overreaction when you say that their real names should have been included? Uh, is that too much to expect? or uh, have the filmmakers actually erred over there? Because at the end of the day, there is a clarification that has now come in that has been included after the intervention of the government. You know, if they, uh, the filmmakers had been uh, uh, so particular about showing the truth, then why did they not show the exact uh, names of the people in government. I mean, we don't hear about Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Prime Minister, there is somebody. 
then we don't hear about Jaswan Singh or Ms. Adwani or me. There is absolutely uh, no depiction of the real names, isn't it? Right. There is, uh, I noticed this in the film and I was disappointed. They should have used real names. The person who was acting as uh, Jaswan Singh should have been shown as Jaswan Singh, not as somebody else. Mm. Uh, that would have um, been more appropriate and uh, would have brought uh, some reality to the, uh, to the film. Again, uh, the names of the terrorists. Mm. They, they should have used the real names of the terrorists and not these pseudonyms which were uh, being used by them. Right. Even the captain, the pilot's name has been changed. Actually, the name has been sort of flipped around a bit, uh, if you would see. Uh, but yeah. also, of course, uh, sir, I'd well, like to ask you, yeah. yeah, there are questions. There are certainly, that's a very valid question. And perhaps uh, uh, the yeah. filmmakers will say it's their creative license, so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Go on, sir. You want, I think you want to say something. No, no. I wanted to say that creative license is absolutely uh, fine. But why did they use the names uh, Bola and uh, Shankar and whatever and not uh, take advantage of creative license there? Mm. I mean, their, their explanation is that these were the names which were being uh, uh, used on the flight. The terrorists were addressing themselves with the, um, uh, by these names. So, that, there they kept to the truth. Mm. Why didn't they keep to the reality, the truth, as far as other actors are concerned? True. True. Sir, anything else you'd like to share with us from the Cabinet Committee okay. meetings at that point of time or uh, uh, any incident that comes to your mind uh, 25 years later that you'd like to share with our viewers? No, I think it was, we all passed through very harrowing times. And... Uh, uh, it was, um, uh, there were tense moments, there were, uh, um, there were a great deal of worries about what might happen ultimately. It was not a football match, you know, where a team loses, a team wins. It was a national problem of the highest importance. And, uh, <clears throat> I would like to say that the government of the day uh, decided uh, to take, um, decided upon its response after a great deal of um, deliberation and in the best interest of uh, the people who were on the flight and in the best interest of national security. Mm. <coughs> that will be my, uh, my response 25 years down the line. And I would say that uh, things always look different in retrospect, but uh, you completely miss the flavor, the, the smells, the, um, you know, all this which go on to make, make a situation, create a situation. That is something which is completely forgotten today. And um, the film also has done no justice to that. Right. Also flying into, you know, Taliban ruled Afghanistan, uh, uh, you know, a regime where we had little or no diplomatic contact. And despite that, do you think that that regime also played an important role during those days as far as the negotiations or those processes were concerned? They did. They did. And I think, I personally think that Jaswan Singh personally going to Kandahar was an act of courage. He has been, uh, uh, he has been criticized for flying with the terrorists. But, uh, you know, the point is, if something had gone wrong, who would have taken responsibility for this? So we had a political person there, completely authorized by the Cabinet Committee on Security and the government of the day, to take decisions on the spot and uh, decide what was in the best national interest. Uh, did and he volunteer to do that, sir? At that point of time was to bring back he volunteered to do that, but as external affairs minister, I think it was also his duty to do that. So I'd say that he performed his duty with great deal of uh, conscientious, 
toughness and uh, with a great deal of courage. He is not with us anymore, but I'd like to pay my homage to him for this act of courage. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yashwan Sinha, for joining us and taking us through those extremely harrowing days and giving us the real picture of what was the thought process at the highest levels of government at that point of time. Thank you so much, sir.